This hearing on the desperate plight of North Korean refugees who face imminent danger of forced repatriation from China will come to water. Some of you have may, may have crossed the Potomac River to attend this hearing today. It flows, as we all know, aside our nation's capital, past many iconic landmarks. For those who are currently watching this hearing in South Korea, the Han River flowing through Seoul likewise holds tremendous historical, cultural, and economic importance. However, for many North Koreans who brave the treacherous journey across the Yalu and Tumen rivers, natural borders between North Korea and China, those rivers represent only sorrow and terror. These rivers have been their only means to escape from the world's cruelest family dictatorship, necessitating desperate crossings by small boat, swimming directly or walking across frozen waters amid the bitter Korean winter, all while knowing that an alert border guard with shoot-to-kill orders could end their lives in an instant. Even after successfully crossing the Yalu and Tumen rivers, the plight of a North Korean refugee can rapidly take a turn for the worse. Startling estimates indicate that up to 80% of female North Korean refugees become victims of human traffickers who exploit them in the lucrative sex trade industry. It is believed that the illicit trade generates over $105 million annually for North Korean and Chinese criminal networks. I would note parenthetically that Suzanne Schulte, who, uh, without objection, her comments will be made a part of the record. In one of my previous hearings, she came and she brought two women, a mother and a daughter. Now, their story was that their other sister or, and the woman's daughter escaped into, I put that in quotation marks, into China. She was sold into modern-day slavery, into sex trafficking. The mother and the daughter then went into China looking for that daughter, and they were enslaved as well. All three of them forced into sex trafficking. By the grace of God and some very, very kind-hearted and empathetic people, they were able to escape, and they made their way into South Korea and ultimately into our hearing room to tell their amazing stories. Uh, that is the plight of so many of these women who make their way into uh, China. The lucky ones try to remain hidden. According to recent, a recent report by Global Rights uh, Compliance, an international human rights law firm, there are approximately half a million female North Koreans, some as young as 12, hiding in border regions. For if they are discovered, they face the likelihood of forced repatriation, or to use the technical term, reformant, to North Korea. Today's hearing is especially timely because we have good reason to believe that such repatriation is imminent as North Korea reopens its border following an extended closure in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is reported that approximately 2,000 North Korean refugees, perhaps many more, are awaiting imminent forced repatriation, which, could, which would subject them to severe human rights violations upon their return to North Korea, some of which we will hear about in testimony from our amazing panel that is assembled here today. I share this with deep concern. I shared this deep concern regarding their perilous situation of North Korean refugees in China, directly with Antonio Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the United Nations, when he visited my office on April 27th. I believe that while there are limits to what our government and South Korean government can do to influence China's decision making, although we need to use everything we could possibly do to influence that, the UN is well positioned and ideally suited to use its influence, given how much the Chinese government seeks validation from and indeed seeks to influence the United Nations system. So again, I ask with deep respect that Secretary General Gutierrez, please use your influence to the utmost to dissuade, dissuade the Chinese government from forcibly repatriating these refugees. It is also extremely important that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grande, take on a more active role on behalf of these refugees. One of our highly distinguished witnesses today, who will be coming in via Zoom, Ambassador Jung Hun Lee, uh, points out in his testimony, and I quote just a small part of it, the legal tools are there for the UNHCR to do more for the North Korean defectors. The UNHCR concluded a bilateral agreement with China in 1995 <clears throat> that granted, <clears throat> pardon me, the UNHCR staff, pardon me again, <clears throat> that granted the UNHCR staff in China unimpeded access to refugees within China. Determining who is a refugee requires interviewing the prospective asylum seekers. With China strictly preventing UNHCR access to North Koreans near the border, the process towards refugee recognition has been completely th 
thwarted, he states. The forcible repatriation of North Koreans seeking refugee status in China is a blatant breach of China's obligations under the 1951 UN Convention related to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol, close quote. On May 30th, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women issued its finding in their review of China calling for unrestricted access by the UNHCR and relevant humanitarian organizations to victims of trafficking from North Korea in China. CEDAW has also recommended that China regularize the status of North Korean women who face human rights violations, such as, such as forced marriage and human trafficking, and refrain from cracking down on them due to their undocumented status. Against all of this moral pressure and legal pressure as well, there are malign incentives, both political and economic, for the People's Republic of China to repatriate refugees to North Korea. North Korea and its dictator Kim Jong-un view those who flee the dictatorship as traitors, which gives China a political incentive to placate a communist ally, which remains a thorn in the side of the United States and all freedom-loving peoples. Economically, a written submission for this hearing, which I ask to be entered into the record uh, and without objection, uh, from the Citizens Alliance for North Korean Human Rights, a human rights NGO based in Seoul sheds light on the disturbing economic incentives that China has in forcibly repatriating these refugees. According to their ongoing investigation, there is a high probability that a portion of products originating from North Korea but produced for Chinese companies have been made in prisons, detaining repatriated North Korean refugees from China using forced labor and other human rights violations, close quote. This suggests that businesses in China are profiting from the exploitation of repatriated North Korean refugees, an issue that demands thorough investigation and accountability. There is, of course, a role that both South Korean government, our government, and indeed Congress and this commission can play. The CECC does report on the situation of North Korean refugees in China in its annual report, and this year will likely issue a standalone report on this issue. While today's hearing is an example of how we can bring attention to this impending humanitarian crisis and disaster. I myself have chaired seven congressional hearings on North Korean human rights, and I have also introduced new legislation, H.R. 638, the China Trade Relations Act of 2023, that withdraws China's permanent normal trade relations, or PNTR, status unless there are substantial and sustained improvements in human rights, including how it treats refugees within its borders. The refugees in question are not mere statistics. Each and every one of these people are individuals with inherent rights, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. China has failed to confront the human traffickers who prey on vulnerable North Koreans. Indeed, they are complicit. If Beijing wishes to be recognized as a true leader in the global community, it must not be complicit in the plight of North Korean refugees in China who are under imminent danger of repatriation. Human rights transcend mere privilege. They are an inherent entitlement. We cannot turn a blind eye to China's complicit and flagrant violations of these rights. I am looking forward to our distinguished witnesses. I'm very proud to uh, introduce our co-chair of this commission, Senator Merkel. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Smith. This commission tries to do its part to shine a light on the plight of North Korean refugees in China, with this year marking the 20th year that we have dedicated a chapter of our annual report to this topic. Yet we last held a hearing on this 11 years ago, so this hearing is, is way overdue, and thank you for arranging it. In many ways, not much has changed. In fact, the announcement for the Commission's first public event on North Korean refugees way back in 2004 included many of the same characterizations we'll hear about today. Desperate individuals fleeing North Korean government prosecution and severe food shortages. Chinese authorities' willful refusal to assess any of these individuals as refugees. Stonewalling UN refugee agency efforts to help those in need. Precisely because so little has changed is why we can't avert our eyes. Human rights abusers play a waiting game, waiting for the world to grow weary, outraged to dissipate, and people to move on. But those who are suffering, they cannot move on. The North Korean and Chinese governments are playing the same cynical game, and we can't let them off the hook. As we'll hear about today, the Chinese government has obligations under Chinese law, under international law, and under just basic human, humanitarian decency to provide individualized determination of the refugee status of asylum 
seekers. Instead, China's approach flouts the principle that anyone has the right to seek asylum, treating all North Korean escapees as illegal immigrants. If anything, this is backward, and all North Koreans who escape to China should be understood to be at risk. The 2014 UN Commission on Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea was clear. The forcible repatriation of thousands of North Koreans subjects them to crimes against humanity. Just being a North Korean in China means an individual would be in grave peril if sent back to North Korea. The UN Commission on Inquiry was equally clear about that. China's approach violates the international principle of non-refoulement, which is supposed to guarantee that nobody will be repatriated to a country where they would face torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment, and other irreparable harm. Irreparable harm is what awaits the vulnerable North Koreans that Chinese authorities plan to send back to the gulag. As much as has not changed on this topic over the last two decades, we're also here holding this hearing because of what has changed. COVID-19 changed much in our world, and the landscape of North Korean defection is no different. Border closures and tougher travel restrictions on both sides of North Korea's border with China made defection more difficult and more expensive. Now, the potential easing of North Korea's border closures raises the specter that China will again start reforcing forcibly repatriating North Koreans. The other thing that has changed is the same thing we observe in so many other contexts. China's Orwellian surveillance state supercharges its ability to keep an eye on the people it seeks to control, including, sadly, North Korean refugees. Vulnerable people facing either repatriation or hiding now face a much more difficult task in remaining hidden or in receiving help without catching the attention of authorities who wish them ill. This all leaves a bleak situation for North Korean refugees in China, but those of us fighting for human rights should not shy away from the challenge and instead must redouble our efforts. I look forward to our witnesses' counsel on what we can do. And just on a personal uh, note, um, I traveled to South Korea and to the border in China with, with North Korea where the, the three highways uh, e exist uh, a few years ago. and. Um, in South Korea met with refugees, some of whom had swum across the, the, the border, some of them who had crossed the land border of China, some who had come through the demilitarized zone. And uh, one young woman, who I'll never forget, had escaped only to be returned as a, a teenager with her father. Uh, he faced uh, horrific punishments. Uh, she faced less harsh punishments, but still a very difficult course. He encouraged her to escape again, but knowing what would happen to his family. But she actually did succeed. And I think about that father um, trying to get his daughter to freedom, knowing the torture that he would be facing. Anyway, we're going to hear from you all as experts, and I'm so glad you've come to share your knowledge, your experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Merkley, very much. I'd like to now welcome our distinguished panel, uh, beginning first with um, Ambassador Robert King, uh, a longtime friend dating back to when he served as Chief of Staff uh, to Congressman Tom Lantos and the Democratic and as st staff, Democratic Staff Director of the House Foreign Affairs Committee from 2001 to 2008. All told, he spent some 25 years on, on the Hill, which is a a very long time. Uh, Ambassador King came uh, and served with great distinction as special envoy for North Korean human rights issues uh, at the U.S. Department of State from 2009 to 2017, which also makes him critically positioned to give testimony to us today, as he did previously in December of 2017. Uh, before a Foreign Affairs Committee hearing that I had chaired, but he did a tremendous job then and is a font of knowledge and insight and counsel and wisdom. Ambassador King has also been a senior advisor to the Korea Chair at the Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS, and it is in that capacity that both he and I served as panelists at a conference not so long ago, uh, co-hosted by Stanford University, uh, entitled North Korean Human Rights at a New Juncture. This is a pleasure to welcome back um, Ambassador King, Bob. Uh, thank you for being here. I then would like to introduce our next uh, panelist, uh, who will be Ambassador Jung Hun Lee, uh, who is currently the Dean uh, at Graduate School at the International Studies and Yonsei University in South Korea. Like Ambassador King, Ambassador Lee is also critically positioned, well suited to serve as a witness for he too served as the inaugural ambassador at large for North Korean human rights for the Republic of Korea, as well as its ambassador for human rights overall. 
It is, was in this capacity that he appeared before our committee in 2014, briefing Congress about the human rights abuses and crimes against humanity in North Korea. His academic affiliations uh, include visiting professorship at Keio University in Japan and senior fellow at Harvard's uh, Kennedy School. Ambassador Lee currently advises the Korean government as chair of the National Unification Advisory Council's International Affairs Committee, chair of the Ministry of Unification newly created Commission for North Korean Human Rights, and policy advisor to the National Security Council. He is a board member of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea in Washington, D.C., and as is Ambassador King, an international patient of Hong Kong Watch in London, which advocates on another issue very close to the hearts of members of this commission. Ambassador Lee received his BA from Tufts University, uh, mauled from Fletcher uh, School of Law and Diplomacy, uh, and his um, uh, doctorate in philosophy from the University of Oxford, uh, St. Anthony's College. Again, welcome Ambassador Lee. We'll then hear from another distinguished witness, Dr. Ethan He. Silk Shin. Dr. Shin is a legal analyst at the Seoul based human rights documentation NGO Transitional Justice Working Group, or TJWG. He too has testified before Congress almost a year ago at a hearing uh, the, of the Tom Blantos Commission, again evaluating the openness towards refugees signaled by the new Yon administration. He offered cutting edge policy recommendations at that time, and I look forward to benefiting again from Dr. Shin's testimony on an urgent and equally important issue. It is my understanding that Dr. Shin has been interviewing North Korean escapees who make their way to South Korea through China in order to record enforced disappearances and other grave human rights violations, make submissions to the UN human rights experts on their behalf, and set up footprints and online database of the people taken by North Korea. He's an advocate for ending China's policy of indiscriminate refoulement uh, for the North Korean refugees without individualized determination that has helped raise the issue at the UN uh, Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, as I mentioned just a few moments ago. Dr. Shin holds a PhD in international law from Yonsei University in South Korea and an LLM from Harvard Law School. Welcome back, Dr. Shin. And finally, we'll hear from Hannah Song, who is here to share her incredible insights into the current situation on the ground for North Korean defectors in China, along with some new up-to-date satellite images. Currently, she is a director of international cooperation and a researcher at the Seoul-based North Korean Human Rights NGO, the Database Center for North Korean Human Rights, or NKDB. In this capacity, Ms. Song has been given rare access to interviewing North Korean escapees from China. Her organization, officially established in 2003, has recorded over 130,000 entries related to human rights violations in its unified human rights database, carried out advocacy based on the data, and has also provided resettlement support to North Korean escapees. NKDB has interviewed over 20,000 North Korean escapees who have resettled in South Korea. Through interviewing North Korean escapees who have recently entered North South Korea since the pandemic, NKDB has been able to examine the current situation on the ground in China and how COVID-19 has changed the landscape of North Korean defection. Ms. Song will share today, for the first time, some of the satellite images of the Chinese detention center where North Korean refugees are believed to be detained. As NK DB, uh, BD's director, Ms. Song, has briefed diplomats, policymakers, foreign correspondents uh, on human rights situation in North Korea. She has created partnerships with international stakeholders, with research institutions and universities and NGOs overseas. Uh, my understanding that Ms. Wilde is back. Any opening comments? No, Sir? no opening comments. Okay. No. Thank you. Uh, I would ask our, our, our witnesses, you know, if you could. Oh, oh I didn't see you. I'm sorry. Mr. Dunn? Commissioner Dunn? Chairman Smith, thank you very much for holding these very important testimonies today. To the panel that is with us, we are privileged to both learn from you and hopefully take away some of the key insights on where the United States can be a leader with allies in Asia to be doing the right thing. As we look at the grave human rights violations being committed by North Korea, we see a China that is complicit. In my military service, I've been privileged to serve on the DMZ in South Korea with our allies in the area and witness the defectors who come across to the South seeking a better life, not only for themselves, but for the country that they know and have loved so well, that of all the Korean people, but are constantly stymied by the fact that a totalitarian regime in Pyongyang is suppressing not only their right to free speech, 
but their very existence in the world. Today we're going to be examining the brutal circumstances of North Koreans who have tried to leave their home, the lack of cooperation in Beijing to provide them any safe haven, and the asylum seekers who stand uh, at the border and detention facilities. Not those who have tried to flee to South Korea, but those who have gone north to China only to be rebuffed and returned to a heinous situation. The people of North Korea, let's make no mistake, are being murdered, starved, and worked to death every year under Kim Jong-un. With limited references to be able to cite because of the Dark Kingdom's suppression of any information leaving North Korea, we know this. The number of people killed in North Korea every year is estimated between 300,000 to 800,000. That's the equivalent of my congressional district back in Iowa being wiped out in one year. It is believed that there are roughly 15 to 25 mass force labor camps throughout the country as well where individuals are forced to toil for the interest of one individual who puts himself before an entire nation. And on the other hand, we have China, the United States' main trading partner in Asia and one of the largest benefactors of international financing institutions and a force in its own right under their global influence of the Belt and Road Initiative. But the reality has never been clear. China and North Korea are criminals of human rights cut from the same cloth. Recent reports show there are currently 2,000 North Korean asylum refugee seekers being held in detention centers near the China-North Korea border. These individuals have endured unimaginable horrors to both themselves and, importantly, to their families. They have escaped one of the most oppressive nations on earth, only to be thrown straight back into that meat grinder by the Chinese government. According to the United States Department of State, the North Korean refugees are repatriated from China, and there they, force, or they face forced labor, forced abortions, torture, and even execution. These crimes against humanity have only increased under the severity of Kim Jong-un's rule. China's refusal to acknowledge not only the sins of North Korea, but to be complicit in returning these individuals makes them equally culpable. For the past two decades, this committee has examined China's blatant ignorance when it comes to international commitments to refugees, denied humanitarian organizations the ability to help those who are most in need, and falsified critical data relating to the scope and the severity of North Korea's refugee crisis, intentionally disinforming the rest of the world. China's continued uh, reparation of North Korean refugees signals to the rest of the world that the Chinese Communist government has never been, nor may it ever be, a safe harbor for the freedom and liberty for those seeking a better life, whether those fleeing North Korea or those within its own borders. Here in the United States, we must not forget the liberties and freedoms we enjoy every day, particularly when in stark relief to what's going on in Asia. On this commission, our men and women in uniform, all those working to spread democracy around the world, are behind those struggling in places like North Korea and even those in China. So, Mr. Chair, I call on this bipartisan commission with the administration to continue to pursue tighter consequences for holding the CCP accountable for its inaction. And for Kim Jong-un specifically, in his role as a grave human rights violator, wishing to live, and for the hope of all those wishing to live in a freer and more prosperous life. Further, I would specifically ask the Premier of China and Beijing to condemn Kim Jong-un's regime. It is well over time that we hold these individuals accountable, to cooperate with asylum seekers and grant hope to those trapped in a land of darkness. Additionally, I call on our international institutions to decrease their tolerance for inclusion of nations that continually violate human rights and close loopholes that allow countries like China to exploit international financial institutions to fund the autocracies occurring across the globe while not holding themselves accountable to the same standards. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back my time but thank our speakers today for your frontline evidence being entered into testimony today. You were the front line and the safeguard of what we're doing going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Dunn, thank you very much for your uh, comments and your, the background you bring to this commission is extraordinary. I uh, would say to our witnesses uh, as I go to Ambassador King, you know, normally there's a five-minute rule, but I would, you know, what you have to impart is so important. If you go up to 10, that would be fine. 
uh, important thing is that you really have your say. We need to hear it. Uh, then we will go to questions. So, Ambassador King, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman. Uh, the Commission has played a very important role, role in terms of calling attention to the problems of China, the human rights violations, and I think it's very useful. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Let me move a little closer. Uh, the Commission has played a very important role, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about these uh, particular issues that we're dealing with with the North Koreans. Uh, the flow of Koreans back and forth between Northeast China and the Korean Peninsula is something that's been going on for centuries. Uh, there are something like 25 million North Koreans, 50 million South Koreans. There are also 2 million Koreans living just across the border in China. So there's a lot of economic and family relationships that continue to play a role in terms of movement back and forth. The issues of North Koreans going through China and to China has been something that uh, over time has changed. During the Cultural Revolution, when conditions were difficult in China, there were Chinese who were coming to North Korea, which with Soviet assistance was doing very well and economically. Uh, in the 1990s, when North Korea was fa facing fairly serious problems with the collapse of co communist support elsewhere, uh, there were significant numbers of North Koreans who went to China and were able to find jobs there as, as they were being employed. One of the things that I found very interesting was when I was in uh, China on the North Korean uh, Chinese border, Sinuiju Dandong, uh, there were a large number of North, uh, North Korean citizens who were employed in China who were returning to North Korea. We happened to walk into the train station and, and saunter around to see what was going on. Uh, the numbers were significant. These were young women who were working as seamstresses. They were living in North Korea, they were working in North Korea, I mean they were living and working in China, but they were North Koreans. And this kind of uh, activity back and forth has been something that's been going on for some time. Uh, there are problems in terms of differences between uh, North Koreans who are going to China. Uh, in addition, there are, there are North Koreans who find jobs in China through the North Korean government. Source of employment, source of uh, funding for the North Korean government, and they're able to do it. The North Korean government, of course, takes a healthy rake off uh, for providing the workers. Uh, there are a second group of North Koreans who work in China. These are North Koreans who go on their own, who illegally cross the border, who work illegally in China, uh, but there are opportunities. There are lots of Korean speakers in the areas they go to, and they're able to find opportunity, find jobs, and support uh, themselves and their families. There's a third group of North Koreans who go into China, and those are North Koreans without approval of their government who are seeking to flee North Korea because of the human rights abuses and other violations. And there are significant numbers of North Koreans who go to China to get out of North Korea because it's fundamentally the only way to get out of North Korea. Other options are not, uh, not really viable. The result is the safest route is going through China. There are some interesting changes that have taken place recently. The COVID pandemic has created great difficulty for North Koreans who are uh, attempting to leave North Korea. Uh, one of the things the North Korean government has done is done very little to deal with the problem of COVID, uh, rejected uh, offers of uh, vaccine, uh, but they've imposed very strict requirements, limiting uh, public contact, limiting movement of people, and so forth. But the net effect has been that uh, the numbers of North Koreans who try to go out of the country are being stopped by border patrols who are trying to prevent North, uh, North Koreans returning because they might be infected with the COVID pandemic. Uh, the COVID virus has, has created real difficulties in terms of these numbers. 
There are large numbers of North Koreans over uh, the last couple of decades who have left North Korea and been able to find uh, homes elsewhere, primarily in South Korea, some in the United States, some in Europe. Uh, over the last uh, two decades, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 34,000 North Koreans who have left North Korea, primarily through China, and been able to get out and go to South Korea. The uh, numbers have varied over time. The highest one-year total of escapees was uh, 2,700 in 2011. Uh, 2012 to 2016, there were 1,500 a year that were getting out. 2017 to 2019, 1,100 a year annually were successfully getting out. When the first COVID case was diagnosed in China in November 2019, the North Koreans shut the borders. The number of individuals who left during 2020 was 229 who were able to leave North Korea and find their way to South Korea. Uh, in 2022, that number was 67. So from a high of over 2,700, we're down now, 34 have escaped so far this year. Uh, these numbers, uh, in addition to the numbers who've gone to South Korea, there are a few who've come to the United States, somewhere around 200 uh, over the last couple of decades. There are about 600 who've found uh, places in England, uh, United Kingdom. There are a few others that have found opportunities elsewhere. But the numbers are down. The North Korean government has created problems because it is so afraid of the spread of the COVID pandemic, they have stopped North Koreans from being returned. The Chinese have arrested North Koreans. The North Koreans will not accept them. And this has created problems, difficulties uh, for the North Koreans who are trying to deal with these problems. Uh, the, the difficulty with North Koreans uh, not being able to return to North Korea means people who want to return, who have families there and who want to return, are not able to be there. They're held by the Chinese. The Chinese hold them in camps uh, where they are basically prisoners uh, so they can repatriate them to North Korea. There are offers from South Korea and other countries to take North Korean refugees. Those are denied. The Chinese will not uh, release these individuals, they're going to return them to North Korea, and that's the only way they will do them. Uh, Chinese government officials, uh, I met with Chinese government officials when I was special envoy on several occasions to raise concern about their treatment of North Koreans who are captured in China and see if there's some way of pressing the Chinese to take a more humane uh, approach to these issues. Uh, I was singularly unsuccessful. I met with North Korean officials at the United Nations in New York, at the uh, UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. I visited uh, China on a number of occasions, met with senior officials in the uh, uh, foreign ministry, with senior officials in the uh, party's international department. Uh, all of them said, these are North Koreans, the North Korean people want them back, we will return them. We need to continue the effort to press the Chinese because these people are being denied their free choice of where they want to go, uh, and they're being held in inhumane conditions in North Korea. If they are returned, or they're in inhumane conditions in China, if they are returned to North Korea, the North Koreans will send them to prison. Uh, some of them will uh, not survive the imprisonment there. We need to continue the effort to press the North, the North Koreans to allow these people not to be held. And we need to press the Chinese 
to release the North Koreans that they are holding and are not being returned to North Korea because the North Koreans are not willing to, to hold them. We need to continue to call attention to the problem because one of the ways of getting the Chinese to pay attention to the issue is to call attention to it, to create bad publicity for China and hope that it eventually moves them to do the right thing. Uh, I look forward to questions and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion on this serious problem. Thank you. Ambassador King, thank you so very much. Uh, I'd like to now yield to, uh, such time as he may consume to Ambassador Lee, who is joining us uh, up on the board there. Ambassador Lee. Good morning. Um, good morning and greetings from Korea. Um, I thank Chairman Chris Smith. It's great to see you again. And Co-Chair Jeff Merkley, uh, Representative Zachary Nunn, uh, ranking members of the Congress and the executive branch for giving me this opportunity to address you today. I'm greatly honored to provide a statement to this commission on the situation of North Korean refugees in China. The last time I attended the congressional hearing was, um, as you mentioned, in June 2014, when I was invited by you, uh, Chairman, Chairman Smith, to the House Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations of the Foreign Affairs Committee. At that time, I emphasized that genocide on top of crimes, crimes against humanity was being perpetrated in North Korea. Well, nine years have passed, but sadly, no progress has been made since. That provision of fundamental human rights continue as people languish under the near eight decade long tyranny of the Kim dynasty. In a normal state, national security is pursued to ensure human security. In North Korea, national security ensures only regime security. The state takes no responsibility to protect its own people. It is no wonder why North Koreans resort to taking refuge across the border. They do so because there's no hope in a country ruled by political prisons, torture, hunger, and public execution, completely void of the fundamental right to adequate standard of living, not to mention life. So why no progress? I will point to five factors. Number one, despite the outstanding findings and recommendations made by the Commission of Inquiry in 2014, the UN has failed to follow up, especially on accountability measures. Number two, South Korea's Moon Jae-in government pursued for five years a delusional peace policy that totally disregarded human rights issues. Such a policy had an impact even on the US as well. The Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act, HR 3446, is a case in point. It calls for peace, but completely ignores human rights. Number three, the media's fixation on Kim Jong-un's nuclear ploy, as well as his public persona, which has had the effect of downplaying human rights. Number four, the previous Trump administration's ill-conceived attempt to woo Kim Jong-un, which helped to skirt human rights issues. And finally, and this was mentioned by Ambassador Bob King, COVID-19 and the complete closure of North Korea's border, which also contributed to the lack of progress because the country was completely shut down. The plight of the North Korean refugees in China stands out as one of the most troubling challenges to the UNHCR. We wouldn't have this conversation if Beijing adhered to its obligations under the 1951 UN Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol, not to mention its 1995 special agreement with the UNHCR. I'll refer the commission to my written text for details. What I'd like to do here is to make two suggestions for consideration. 
first suggestion is to apply pressure on the UNHCR's Beijing office to do justice to its mandate. Pursuant to its 1995 agreement with China, the UNHCR should have unimpeded access to North Korean asylum seekers in China. But as we all know, North Koreans in China are off limits to the UNHCR. The refugee agency should assert its right to binding arbitration. This really should be done now, since several thousand North Korean detainees are in danger of imminent repatriation. My second suggestion to the China Commission is to benchmark the international campaign that was launched against South Africa's apartheid system in the 1970s and the 80s. What did the UN General Assembly do to South Africa? In 1974, the Credentials Committee of the General Assembly denied South Africa of its credentials and suspended all its activities in the United Nations. I'd say it's time to re-examine the UN credentials of North Korea too. If South Korea, uh, I'm sorry, if South, Af South Africa was bad enough to, to be suspended from all UN activities for 20 years, shouldn't the UN General Assembly consider doing the same to North Korea until the non-proliferation and human rights goals are met? I would think yes, but what has the UN done instead? It recently elected North Korea to the executive board of the WHO, and in June last year, the UN permitted North Korea to assume presidency of the disarmament conference. This is absolutely laughable. If we don't take real actions today, I assure you, I could be invited back to a congressional hearing in 2033, and we will be echoing the same old rhetoric. That's 10 more years of human suffering in North Korea. I'd like to conclude by commending the China Commission again for holding today's hearing. Your attention represents a beacon of hope for those North Koreans in China desperately yearning for freedom. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you. Ambassador Lee, thank you so very much for your statement and your recommendations. Uh, I'd like to now to yield to Dr. Shin. Congressman Smith, uh, Senator Merkley, and esteemed members of the Congressional uh, <coughs> Executive Commission on China, thank you for inviting me to speak at today's hearing. Eleven years ago, uh, as the members have mentioned, this commission held a hearing on China's repatriation of North Korean refugees. It is with a very heavy heart that I note the continuation of China's policy, unconscious, po unconscionable policy uh, towards North Korean refugees today. <coughs> Last month, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, expressed its concern that China is a country of destination for trafficking in women and girls from North Korea for purposes of sexual exploitation, forced marriage, and concubinage. That North Korean women and girls defectors are categorically uh, classified as illegal migrants, and some are forcibly returned. The CEDAW Committee recommended China to protect North Korean victims of trafficking, to give the UN High Commission for Refugees, UNHCR, full and un unimpeded access, and to allow their children to leave China with their mothers. Beijing's long-standing policy of repatriation of North Korean refugees has resulted in their suffering of crimes against humanity in North Korea, as documented by the UN Commission of Inquiry in 2014. It is difficult to obtain accurate information about North Korean escapees in China because of uh, Pyongyang and Beijing's deliberate policy of information blackout. While it is not impossible to pierce this fog of totalitarianism, 
various measures accelerated and justified during the COVID pandemic is making it ever more difficult to contact or assist North Korean refugees. North Korea diverted its scarce resources, not only for WMD development, but also for building a security wall along the, secu the Chinese border, uh, which is not unlike the Berlin Wall, uh, to permanently imprison its own population. Uh, one might call it a Chuche Wall. On the Chinese side, the proliferation of CCTVs coupled with AI-based facial recognition and surveillance of WeChat uh, devices, uh, first test tested in Xinjiang and then expanded, expand expanded to China proper, has made the North Korean refugees' internal movement uh, difficult. The cost of moving within China has skyrocketed as a result, and even alternative escape routes to Mongolia have resulted in many arrests uh, in Inner Mongolia. Since the early 2000s, Beijing's official position has been to handle North Koreans in accordance with its domestic law, international law, and humanitarian principles. However, China's policy, policy fails to meet any of these three purported criteria. Article 32 of the PRC Constitution provides that the people, PRC may grant asylum to foreigners who request it on political grounds. Moreover, Article 46 of the Exit and Entry Administra Administration Law, which was enacted in 2012, states that foreigners applying for refugee status may, during the screening process, stay in China on the strength of temporary identity, identity certificates issued by public security organs. However, China has failed to institute a screening process for North Korean asylum seekers uh, and to provide them with temporary identity certificates. China has similarly failed to extend national legal protection to ethnic refugees from uh, Myanmar. If China cannot respect its own national law, one might ask, how can it expect it to be respected by the rest of the international community? China ratified the Refugee Convention in 19, 1982 uh, as you know, in response to the influx of Han Chinese and other ethnic minorities of uh, refugees from Vietnam and Laos, and has even allowed UNHCR to access asylum seekers from Pakistan, Iraq, Somalia, and Eritrea. For the North Korean asylum seekers, however, China categorically rejects the individualized determination of their status and denies UNHCR access. China also continues forcible repatriation of North Korean escapees who should be protected by the principle of non-refoulement, not only under the Refugee Convention and the Protocol, but also under the Torture Convention, as was highlighted for the first time by the UN Human Rights C uh, Council's North Korean Human Rights Resolution uh, this April. China has even re uh, repatriated South Korean POWs who had escaped from North Korea, uh, as in the case of Mr. Han Man-taek in 2005, contrary to China's legal obligations under the Geneva Convention. Beijing cites treaties with Pyongyang to justify its policy of deportations, but they cannot overrule human rights norms enshrined in the Universal Declaration and human rights treaties. While Beijing uses the term humanitarian principles as meaningless diplomatic rhetoric, some Chinese people actually display humanitarian consideration for North Korean refugees. One, one North Korean SKP recounted that public security agents who apprehended her released her because they determined that their job was bringing criminals to justice, not arresting and deporting innocent women whose only crime was fleeing North Korea. It is well known that pregnant North Korean women sent back to North Korea and their babies face abortion or infanticide to avoid corruption of Korean, quote unquote, corruption of Korean racial purity by Chinese blood. Uh, I cannot think of any country other than North Korea that carries out mass abortions or infanticides on such a racist ground. Nor can I think of any country other than China that would enable such mass abortions or infanticides against quote unquote its own blood. China has even ignored UNHCR's proposal in 2004 to create a special humanitarian status for North Koreans. In the recent years, certain localities in China have issued resident permits quote unquote to the North Korean women married to Chinese men but they are primarily a means of control to enable a systematic monitoring of North Korean women with limited freedom of movement locally. In short, the existence of North Korean women is tolerated only insofar as they, as they, <coughs> as they serve as wives to sometimes abusive Chinese husbands and as mothers to children, 
deprived of individual freedom or agency. Given the dire human rights and humanitarian crisis that will unfold in the event of the resumption of forceful repatriation, the international community must act now to pierce the fog of totalitarianism and to hold Beijing accountable to its domestic law, international law, and humanitarian principles. The international human community must call upon Beijing to release information concerning, one, the number of North Korean detainees that are awaiting deportation to North Korea, Two, the number of North Koreans who have issued, quote unquote, who have been issued uh, residence permits. Three, the known number of children born between North Korean women and Chinese husbands. And four, the procedure for applying for the refugee status by North Koreans, if one exists. China also needs to end the return of North Korean refugees, implement the process for individualized determination of status for North Korean asylum seekers, provide them with temporary documentation, and to permit North Korean refugees and their children to resettle in third countries such as South Korea. Concerned governments must make recommendations to China during its universal periodic review at the Human Rights Council, which is scheduled for next January. The international community should also ensure that Chinese nationals responsible for North Korea's crimes against humanity are documented by the UN accountability mechanism for North Korea. Another option to consider uh, is to expand the uh, Office of Human Rights, High Commission for Human Rights Office in Seoul, which currently only has mandate over North Korea, into a regional office for Northeast Asia, including China, similar to the OHHR Regional Office for Southeast Asia in Bangkok. The UNHCR also needs to speak up for North Korean refugees in China, as it has done up to 2013. Uh, instead of praising China's Belt and Road initiatives as definitely helpful with global refugee work. Given its extensive experience handling the issue during its previous stint as the High Commissioner for Refugees, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres should lead the diplomatic efforts with interested states to engage President, Xin, uh, President Xi Jinping on this issue. In the, in the summit statement in April, South Korea and the United States pledged to strengthen cooperation to promote human rights in the DPRK, as well as to reserve the issues of abductions, detainees, and unrepaid prisoners of war, and condemn the DPRK's blatant violation of human rights and the dignity of its own people and its decision to dis distribute its scarce resources to WMD development. In the same vein, the two governments should issue bilateral and bilateral statements expressing concerns about North Korean refugees, including at the UN General Assembly and Security Council. In addition to the Magnitsky sanctions, given that North Korean refugees repatriated to North Korea provide slave labor that serve Chinese businesses in northeastern China, Congress can also consider strengthening existing sanctions legislation to require Chinese exporters from this area to provide proof that North Korean labor was not involved in their supply chains. I would like to conclude by conveying a message to the commission from Ms. Kim Jong-ah, a courageous North Korean woman SKP who had to leave behind one daughter in North Korea and another in China when fleeing to South Korea. <coughs> South Korea. She told me to share with you the pain of continuing her human rights advocacy despite being diagnosed with liver cirrhosis after 14 years of forced separation with her daughter in China because of a China Chinese man that she had to forcibly marry through human trafficking. She says she will continue her struggle because of the heart-wrenching pain of North Korean women SKPs like hers. It's not an event that from 14 years in the past, but an ongoing ordeal. So long as China persists with its policy of repatriation, this will continue. <clears throat> Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Chair, Mr. Co-Chair, esteemed members of the Commission, thank you for holding this session today regarding the urgent and critical situation faced by North Korean refugees in China. Today, on behalf of those who cannot be here physically today, I hope to shed light and be a voice for the thousands of silenced North Koreans who have, thought, who have sought refuge in China, only to face unimaginable hardships and persecution. I want to begin by sharing the story of Ms. Kim, who my organization met just a few weeks ago, who entered South Korea in early 2023. She was trafficked into China at the young age of 18 after simply wandering into a train station in Chongjin, North Korea, looking for her mother who had gone missing. 
after entering a forced marriage to a man decades older than herself. For over 10 years, she lived in constant hiding, evading authorities and struggling for survival. Tragically, an accident exposed her lack of identification, leading to a capture by the Chinese Public Security Bureau and subsequent repatriation to North Korea. In North Korea, she endured unspeakable torture and punishment, and she was sentenced to five years in prison for being labeled a traitor to the state. Upon her release in 2019 in North Korea, she bravely crossed the border again, this time determined to reach South Korea. However, her plans were thwarted by the onset of what we know as COVID-19 pandemic, leaving her trapped in China for four long years under increasing surveillance and constant fear of recapture, knowing very well what would happen if she were to return to North Korea a second time. In 2023, she finally found a broker who warned her of impeding repatriations. This, desperate to avoid her previous fate, she took a leap of faith, paying a steep price to secure her passage to South Korea. Miss Kim's journey embodies the resilience and courage of those who strive for freedom against all odds. However, sadly, her new beginning in South Korea is not the reality for the th thousands of North Koreans who are currently detained in the detention facilities in China. Time is of the essence and we must act swiftly. In China, we believe there are over 10,000 North Koreans who are residing secretly without legal status or protection. They are refugees by the clear definition of the 1951 Refugee Convention. Their stories are filled with unimaginable suffering and their quest for freedom is both courageous and urgent. However, the fate that awaits them upon forced repatriation to North Korea is beyond comprehension. As was described by my fellow witnesses, arbitrary detention, torture, forced labor, and even execution are the grim realities that these North Koreans face. And the fear they carry is not unfounded. It is supported by documented evidence and countless testimonies of those who have escaped the clutches of the oppressive North Korean regime. Shockingly, the Chinese government still determines and labels these as illegal economic migrants and forcibly repatri repatriates them under bilateral border pat protocol signed with North Korea. Our database at NKDB records, has recorded over 8,125 cases of forced repatriation and over 32,000 cases of other human rights violations such as torture, sexual violence and executions associated with those who have been forcibly repatriated. And unfortunately, the plight of the North Korean refugees is further exacerbated by the threat posed by China's surveillance technology. China's increased use of advanced surveillance tools such as facial recognition and biometric systems has become a repressive weapon targeting the most vulnerable, an issue that this very commission has raised in the past. And we cannot forget that this includes North Korean refugees as well. These technologies enable monitoring and trafficking of individuals in China, leaving no room for anonymity anonymity and invisibility, making it increasingly difficult for escapees to avoid repatriation. The living conditions of North Korean escapees in China during the implementation of China's zero, pol zero COVID policy has been dire. As Ambassador Robert King mentioned, before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were around 1,000 to 2,000 North Korean escapees who would reach South Korea every year. However, the combination of China's surveillance technology and North Korea's extreme border measures, including shoot on site orders and the expanded fences has caused a drastic decline. As was already mentioned, only 67 individuals successfully reached South Korea last year. Video cameras, facial recognition software have played a significant role in suppressing these numbers, making escape an almost insurmountable challenge for North Koreans. NKDB has recently spoken to, North, to uh, many who have revealed the distressing reality. Broker fears have skyrocket, skyrocketed. In the past, in the early 2000s to 2010s, broker fees were about 1,500 US dollars. Just before the COVID-19 pandemic, $15,000 per person to bring a person to freedom. Now, as of early 2023, close to $40,000 need to be paid for broker, to brokers to allow safe passage. 
However, over the past three years, broker fees have not only skyrocketed, but many brokers are scared to put themselves at risk. We have heard of people offering $75,000 to a broker and have been rejected because the broker have themselves faced security concerns. Even brokers face significant obstacles in supporting defections from North Korea through China. As China has embraced electronic payment systems tied to identification, making cash transactions nearly impossible, the proliferation of facial recognition technology, QR codes, and China's many surveillance efforts has severely restricted the movements of North Koreans. The decline in defections is not due to a diminished desire among North Koreans to escape this repressive regime. Rather, it reflects the mounting difficulties imposed by China's pervasive surveillance measures. Regrettably, this situation has allowed China to achieve its objective of effectively curbing successful defections, further cementing its control. As COVID-19 restrictions ease, we have witnessed North Koreans in China attempting to defect to South Korea once again, seeking that freedom. Tragically, these attempts over the past few months have resulted in increased arrests. NKDB over the past few months has received many accounts from North Korean escapees in South Korea who have shared the distressing experiences of their family members who have been apprehended and detained in China while attempting to flee again. Chinese authorities, who had been previously hesitant to actively arrest these individuals due to the repatriation challenges, have now intensified their efforts once again to forcibly repatriate them to North Korea. The closure of the Chinese and North Korean border due to the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a sharp increase in the number of North Korean refugees who have been detained awaiting repatriation. If the border were to reopen and forced repatriation resumed, a dire humanitarian crisis would unfold. Reports from survivors de detail horrifying experiences of torture, beatings, electri electric shocks, and sexual violence. These acts are designed to instill fear and further subjugate these individuals. However, without access to first-hand accounts from detainees or inside the sources, it becomes increasingly challenging to assume the complete scope of these circumstances within which North Korean refugees are being held. To gain insights into the situation, NKDB, my organization, has been closely monitoring the six established repatriation routes for any notable changes, particularly during this COVID-19 pandemic. There are six known detention facilities that are run by the Public Security Border Defense Corps on the Chinese side, on the border in the cities of Tandong, Tonghua, Changbei, Longjing, Tumen, and Heilong, where North Koreans are detained before repatriation. Examination of satellite imagery provided by NK Pro, based in South Korea, based on information provided by NKDB, reveals significant developments at the facility, particularly in Heilong, which we can see behind me today. Heilong is known for repatriating North Korean refugees to Musan in North Hamgyong province. What we can see here in these two images is one from 2019, before the pandemic, and the second one sh reveals construction after the COVID-19 pandemic. We can see new fencing, additional facilities surrounding a watchtower overlooking the border. Furthermore, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in the summer of 2021, new buildings were erected within the premises of the detention centers, as well as the renovation of the existing new building, which we can see by the change in the roof tiles in the images behind me. These observations raise compelling questions. Why did they need to build and expand these, these detention facilities in the first place? and who was mobilized to construct these facilities. The inability to directly answer essential questions about the detention facilities in China is deeply troubling. In the past, NKDB and other organizations have had access to North Korean escapees who have shared their harrowing experiences and bravely shed light on the human rights violations as well as the facilities in China as well. However, the current lack of access hampers our ability to fully comprehend the condition within these facilities. This knowledge gap poses a significant concern. It allows for impunity, an increase in human rights violations, and a lack of accountability. What we 
When we cannot fully investigate and understand the operations and practices within these detention facilities, perpetrators of human rights violations are emboldened. The absence of external scrutiny enables violations to occur without consequences, perpetrating a climate of unchecked mistreatment and further eroding the rights and dignity of individuals. The lack of transparency and accountability undermines the principles of justice and human rights. Just across the facility that we can see in these images lies Musan County, a border town housing one of North Korea's largest iron mines. When North Korea reopens its border with China, Beijing is expected to repatriate these North Korean escapees back to North Korea where they will be forced to endure forced labor. The eyes of the world at this moment are fixed on the highly anticipated opening of the North Korean and Chinese border. This not only impacts trade and economic exchanges, but also presents a unique opportunity to prevent North Koreans from once again being isolated from the rest of the world. North Korea, as we know, is the most isolated country in the world. And COVID-19 did more damage to the North Korean people than any sanctions could ever do. However, amidst this anticipation, we must not overlook the fate of those currently detained at the border who anxiously await repatriation. These individuals have risked everything to escape an oppressive regime. They have found themselves in a precarious situation. The fear of being forcibly returned to North Korea where they would face severe punishment and persecution weighs heavily on their hearts as they've been detained for close to three years. I want to echo the recommendations that my fellow witnesses have mentioned ahead of me. It is imperative that the United States government and the international community takes every possible measure to prevent the forced repatriation of North Korean refugees and provide them with the necessary protection. Robust diplomatic efforts is imperative to urge China to refrain from forcibly repatriating these vulnerable individuals. And we strongly recommend facilitating the safe passage of North Korean refugees to South Korea, to the US, and other third countries. There have been instances in the past where North Korean refugees have been brought directly from China on commercial airlines through clandestine efforts by the South Korean governments. This can be done again. We call upon China to grant the Red Cross access to detention facilities, as well as the UNHCR, who must be empowered to exercise their mandate. The lives of these individuals hang in the balance. They have endured unimaginable suffering and live in constant fear. As a global community, we bear the responsibility to protect and support those who have risked everything in their pursuit of freedom. I thank the Commission again of bringing light to the issue, and I believe that we can create a future where North Korean refugee is left behind. Thank you again. Ms. Song, thank you so very much uh, for your testimony. Thank you for bringing that satellite imagery, which shows a build up, not a build down, uh, towards more incarceration and abuse. So thank you for that and, and all of your comments today. Uh, I have a number of questions. I'll start off with a few, then yield to my colleagues, and then if we Ken, we'll have a second round to, to go into some further uh, issues. You know, one thing that troubles me deeply, and I, I know it is all of you by your, your testimonies, is this lack of action. Why the inaction? Uh, is the United States doing enough? Is South Korea doing enough? Uh, and maybe above all, is the United Nations doing enough? Because it does have the responsibility. Uh, as you pointed out, Ambassador Lee, in your comments, uh, you know, the UN has failed to follow up. Their 2014 UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the Democratic Republic of Korea identified the state's systematic and widespread crimes against humanity, including forced labor, forced abortions, infanticide, public execution, a massive gulag system, and overseas abductions. And you pointed out the predicament of the North Korean escapees in China was also highlighted uh, in that report accusing China of aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. And, uh, you know, Okay, it's all there. Good statement. We had hearings about it. We, we asked that it be implemented. And as uh, Ambassador Lee pointed out, the UN has failed to follow up. Um, why this lack of concern? And matter of fact, we seem to be going in the wrong direction to the UN, as you pointed out, Ambassador Lee, uh, when, when um, the North Korean government gets a, 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 a slot on the WHO, uh, on the executive committee, and serves as president last year of the disarmament uh, conference. Uh, I mean, that is like 
abs theater of the absurd to be doing that. Uh, you don't uh, stand up to human rights abuse by enabling the abuser. You just don't do it. It doesn't work. Never has worked. And I think your, your comment about apartheid, and I was here in 1980, in 81, 82, and when we did sanctions against apartheid, and it was right that we did a, a sanctions, and the UN was all in on that. Uh, so I think your, th your thoughts, uh, Ambassador Lee, about the UN credentials uh, is, I think, a very significant recommendation, and hopefully we can follow up on it. But your point about the uh, Beijing Office of UNHCR not doing enough, uh, but it does start at the top, and I would hope that in Geneva and New York, uh, there would be a, a pivot towards really, this is an opportunity. This is all imminent, it's gonna happen any day now, any week now, uh, and this crisis could be averted uh, if the UN, I think, would be very robust. So why, why aren't we doing enough? Let me just say parenthetically, too, that in the past, uh, there was criticisms leveled by Andrew Natsios, you remember in 2014, uh, who used to be the head of USAID and also uh, ran a, a, um, a human rights organization dedicated to uh, Korea, North Korea. Uh, and he made the point, why did we separate human rights from the nuclear talks? You know, when they failed and, and burnt out, yes, Ambassador King did yeoman's work, but he's one man. It should have been a whole of government approach to every time we talk uh, to the North Koreans, human rights is there uh, at the table as well, uh, so that hopefully we get some amelioration of these abuses. So um, again, this, <clears throat> as you said, just bottom line, uh, and without objection, by the way, all of your full statements, I know, Dr. Shin, you had 16 pages of single spaced. Uh, all of you have spent a great deal of time putting together very, very good and excellent testimony will be made a part of the record. Uh, you point out uh, um, the legal tools are there for the UNHCR to do more for the North Korean defectors. Why aren't they doing it? And why aren't we doing more? Ambassador King? Uh, we can always do more, and we should be doing more. Uh, one of the problems the United Nations encounters is there are a lot of countries who have similar problems. One of the reasons why it was much easier to uh, make progress on South Africa was there are a number of African countries who had recently become members of the United Nations who were concerned about what was happening in South Africa. Unfortunately, we don't have that same numerical advantage in terms of dealing with North Korea. One of the things that I think we need to be careful of is uh, this isn't going to be a quick thing. It's going to take time. Uh, we have made progress. Uh, we've created, there's a special rapporteur uh, that the United Nations established, reports to the UN Human Rights Council, reports to the General Assembly, once a year to both bodies, issues are raised, the North Koreans are called on the carpet. Uh, we're not moving troops to North Korea to solve the problem. But we are putting pressure on North Korea, and the thing that we need to keep in mind is that we've got to keep the pressure consistent. We've got to keep it up. We've got to continue. Uh, it isn't going to happen overnight, but it does make progress eventually. Uh, the North Koreans, who uh, have been uh, uh, reluctant to uh, allow any UN officials to come to North Korea, uh, actually allowed the uh, uh, special uh, rapporteur on persons for disabilities to come to North Korea to see what they've done. And the North Koreans on the disability area have made progress. They haven't made the progress that they ought to make on human rights, but we can't give up. We've got to keep pushing. And I think the important thing here is that we've got to continue, keep it up, continue to press, and continue to do. And uh, eventually, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find some progress. Ambassador Lee? Yeah, um, I mean, it's um, such an important question that you raised, um, Chairman Smith. The problem with North Korea is that um, the world is not doing enough because the world does not know enough about what is going on uh, in that country. Um, when it comes to, for example, famine in Africa or refugee crisis in the Middle East, we have vivid visual pictures, like documentaries, photos, uh, journalists are allowed to go in. So we have pictures of, um, you know, little babies um, with 
um, was their bellies um, um, bloated from from hunger, um, dying in the you know in the arms of, of of their mother. So we have these pictures, but we don't have any of that when it comes to North Korea because North Korea is the most closed off cocoon society in the world. Period. So. It's very, very important that that you know we continue to make progress and we continue to make efforts to get as much information into that country as well as get as much information out of that country. And I'm I'm really hoping that we'll have um, sophisticated enough of in terms of drones, not just for military uses, but I think they will the technology will be you know Hannah showed the satellite images, but I, I hope that, you know, eventually we'll have much clearer images through drone of what is going on in these um, political uh, prison camps. So, um, and that's one of the reasons you know, to answer your question, why are we doing enough? That, that's probably why, because a lot of people, a lot of people in general just don't know what is going on. I mean, what is the image of North Korean human rights violation that comes to your head? Um, it's very difficult to capture an image. So I think we have to make every effort to to come up with something that you know that the world can you know to rally around to to have an iconic picture of what North Korean uh, human rights is um, um, is is all about. And also we have to name and shame. Um, I mean, how many times has has there been cases of? I mean, it's not just. North Korean defectors, um, you know, in danger of being repatriated imminently once the border opened. It's been happening over, you know, over three decades, right? And where was the UNHCR when, you know, every time this has happened? So we have to call them out. I mean, certainly China, um, but the UNHCR as well. So, um, and, and also we have to put Faces to the names. So we have to. I, I think the NKDB does an excellent job. Um, the organization that um, that that Hannah Song is um, involved with, in in you know keeping track of all the North Korean defectors in who who found their sanctuary in South Korea. But we have to put human picture, human names to every individual uh, who suffer and keep monitoring. I know that the the, the China Commission is about monitoring. So we have to keep monitoring, you know, each and every individual and keep track of, you know, what is happening to these people, even when they get, you know, repatriated back to uh, North Korea. So it's a, it's a gargantuan um, task ahead. But, um, but these are some of the things that, you know, we have to make these efforts to, to so that their stories will be heard um, um, better uh, by the, in, the, in the world. Thank you, Ambassador. Dr. Shin. Thank you. I agree with everything that Ambassador Lee and Ambassador King just said. I uh, just want to add also that uh, we, I believe uh, we lost this very critical momentum uh, which was built up after the 2014 COI report uh, under the previous administration in both countries uh, where this kind of uh, talks or diplomatic negotiations with uh, Pyongyang that uh, basically excluded the human rights uh, theme. Uh, it uh, resulted in uh, this uh, not only loss of a momentum, but all, uh, also uh, uh, this big uh, setback for the North Korean human rights movement. Uh, for example, in South Korea's case, uh, we had a couple of uh, North Korean defectors uh, who came by sea uh, sent back to uh, North Korea in November of 2019. And, uh, Although, um, so the, uh, I believe that the current uh, governments in both uh, countries are more committed to the North Korean human rights issues, uh, but it's important to that um, it's takes it will take some time to regain this kind of momentum, not only at the to this kind of national levels, but also, for example, at the UN Security Council, uh, where the the public discussion of North Korean human rights uh, issues stopped uh, since uh, 2018, 17. 
Yes, and uh, also want to add that uh, uh, there are other other countries like, uh, for example, like Mongolia, uh, Vietnam, and uh, Laos, where uh, the few North Korean SKPs that have uh, somehow uh, made it to from China, uh, those countries are not necessarily uh, friendly to the for the refugees. And uh, again, uh, that's another area where the international community perhaps uh, can uh, redouble the diplomatic efforts to uh, make it. A, a uh, more safer place for those uh, North Korean refugees. Thank you. Ms. Sung, thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, Chairman. Um, I want to echo what Ambassador Lee said about the world doesn't do enough because it doesn't know enough. Governments, including the US, including Canada, the EU, they spend millions of dollars tracking naval ships to see if North Korea is evading sanctions. How much are they spending on monitoring human rights violations? Many North Korean uh, institutions are um, designated by the US government, the EU, and by the UK to be perpetrators of human rights violations. But are we doing enough in terms of how we are monitoring North Korea's sanctions for weapon development as we are for their violations of human rights? I think that is where we can start. That is something we can begin to do even today. And secondly, in terms of why is the UNHCR not doing more, I think many think that just because of China and North Korea's unique diplomatic ties, it's easy to um, not expect China to do more. However, what we can see in Russia is an interesting example. Russia, as we all know at the moment, as we're all following, is responsible for some of the most serious war crimes and human rights violations in this very modern day. However, Russia allows UNHCR to have access to North Korean refugees who are in the country. There are many overseas laborers in Russia who have been dispatched by the North Korean government to make a profit for their own regime, and many choose to escape. Many will leave their logging sites, their construction sites, and seek refuge. And they seek refuge via the UNHCR. They, as we um, mentioned earlier, about 67 escapees came to South Korea last year. The majority of these people were overseas laborers. The majority of them did not come directly from North Korea or from China, but they actually came from Russia, the Middle East, and African states where they have been working as forced uh, laborers, and they had access to UN agencies. The UN is doing more in other countries. We cannot let them just use the excuse that China is a difficult country to work with. Russia is a difficult country to work with, yet they are doing more there. So that is an example that we can take, and I hope this commission can push forward on that as well. Thank you. Co-Chair Merkley. Uh, thank you. And I wanted to start with recognizing that our testimony has established that over uh, several decades we've had the same basic conditions. And Ambassador King, you noted your efforts as a special envoy and how difficult it was to make progress. In uh, 2017, Senator Markey and I uh, went to South Korea. We met with uh, refugees. And we asked the question, why is China so resistant uh, to facilitating the passage of refugees who come from North Korea onto South Korea or to other nations in the region? Uh, the answer we received was this, that China is absolutely committed to maintaining North Korea as a buffer against the West. And they fear that if they have a humane refugee policy or refugee policy that follows international law, that basically North Korea will collapse because a whole elite world in North Korea wants to get out of North Korea, wants their children to get out of North Korea. Is this the right explanation why China has been so resistant uh, to uh, honoring the Geneva Convention, honoring its own law? And if, in fact, that is an accurate assessment, how does that affect our strategy in terms of gaining ground uh, on the issues we're talking about today? Ambassador King. Uh, thank you very much for your question and for your comments and for your interest and concern on this issue. Uh, I think that the Chinese definitely want to have a buffer. They're much more comfortable having North Korea immediately on their border than having a, a democratic, open society like South Korea. Uh, but I think there are other things as well. I think the Chinese are concerned about their own internal situation. 
that again is a regime that is very repressive. Uh, North Korea is worse, and it's hard to find one worse than China, but North Korea is. And simply allowing the kinds of things that we seek in terms of allowing North Koreans to leave, to freely go, to be able to make decisions on, on their own fate uh, is something they don't want to allow in their own country. So it's, it's, yes, they want to buffer, but also they are concerned about the possibility of the example, the example. that that might show. So it makes it even harder, another uh, uh, example. So uh, this brings me, Ambassador Lee, uh, to your commentary about the power of UNHCR and, um, and the value or the potential with binding arbitration. I had not heard before today's testimony uh, about this, this UNHCR power. What prevents, how do, how do we, how powerful is this? Uh, do we have a, a strategy in which we could uh, really drive the UNHCR, uh, given the, the difficulty of persuading China otherwise to uh, honor the Geneva Convention? Ambassador Lee, are you still with us? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your question. I'm not, I'm not so sure if we can um, consider what's available for the UNHCR as a powerful tool. What I was saying is that in the case that the UNHCR is prevented from doing its job uh, in China, that it can resort to this binding arbitration, which, which means that you know, if there is a conflict of interest between the Chinese government and the UNHCR, in the work that the UNHCR is doing in China, uh, within 45 days, that it can call for a, you know, an arbitration, so, and and an arbitrator that can be agreed upon by both sides will come in and 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 try to resolve the issue. But as far as I know, I, I, I don't think I'm wrong. Um, that's never been the case. And you know, why is then UNHCR? Um, not being much more proactive or much more progressive in dealing with this issue, it's probably because the the refugee agency is you know is concerned that you know if it really tried to take on the North Korean refugee issue, that China China might just kick them out, and that is not you know completely out of the question knowing what China does to any organizations or businesses that, you know, that, that do things counter to the national interest of, of China. Um, now, that might not work out, but, you know, I'm, I'm just very disappointed that, you know, it's not actually using all its, um, you know, the, the contractual legal tools uh, on hand to deal with China um, simply because China doesn't want it um, to to uh, to do so, can I just um, can I just uh, raise um, a point uh, that you've made about the about the 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 North Korean refugees um, and you know China being afraid of a mass exodus uh, and that you know this could create an instability uh, even in China. There is a case in 2017, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, Guardian um, reported in 2017 um, because there was a, a report um, made by Guardian that China secretly was making plans to have a network of refugee camps along the you know, 880 miles border with with North Korea. Um, you know, just in case that there is some sort of a contingency that that you know that there might be a collapse, you know, or whatever. Now, later on, of course, the Chinese uh, foreign ministry uh, denied this, but you know, there was a leak um, by internal documentation, and at that time, it was a state-run telecom giant called. China Mobile, uh, which revealed the, uh, uh, the plan, which was carried by the 
uh, Guardian. So China is actually thinking, of, you know, they have been thinking about this uh, for, for many years. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's not completely out of the question to hope that China uh, might, you know, come along in, in setting up some sort of, you know, even temporary settlement sanctuaries uh, for the refugees from, from North Korea. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador. And you mentioned uh, some other ideas about encouraging uh, China to set up a, a corridor for refugees to Mongolia, Vietnam, Burma, Laos, uh, or possibly granting amnesty to illegal aliens, and then the, the refugee camps. Uh, the, um, uh, it is uh, really uh, frustrating uh, that uh, we haven't found an effective way to push uh, China and uh, Dr. Shin, and I'll st I think I'll stop with this question. Uh, the um, you, the in terms of the the Chinese government's own law to set up a screening process for those who assert their desire for asylum, that's required, as I understand it, by Chinese law. It's required by the Refugee Convention. What is the as you think about the different tools we have and how how little effect we've had so far? And I'll send this question to both you and, and uh, Ms. Song. What is, this, what is the most effective way we can apply pressure? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question, Senator. So it's obviously not easy to persuade the Chinese government on this issue uh, because of the uh, very, they view this uh, from a very geopolitical issue, point of view, that uh, if they change, have this kind of change of policy, uh, it could lead to the not only the uh, the collapse of the North Korean state, but also their own uh, regime as well. <coughs> But uh, I think China, at least, is more amenable to this kind of international discourse and pressure than uh, North Korea is, and which is why we should uh, utilize all available uh, UN and also diplomatic uh, mechanisms. And uh, I would say that um, with respect to the this kind of implementing the uh, the, uh, the refugee uh, uh, processing uh, procedure, I think it's important to. Uh, basically tell China also that uh, their, I guess, take on this issue is somewhat driven by paranoia as well, in the sense that uh, there, of, uh, there is this uh, there is a historical precedent back in 1989 when uh, that this was the, uh, when the collapse of East, East Germany basically happened when the Hungary, the, which was ruled by a reform, communist but reformist government at the time, opened its borders with uh, Austria and allowed uh, hundreds of thousands of East Germans to exit to West Germany through this uh, corridor. And uh, that's the kind of fear I understand that uh, China has, uh, which might have made sense in the more made more sense in the 1990s. But uh, at present, I think that uh, many UN officials too uh, consider that, that kind of uh, scenario is very unlikely, even if China reconsiders and uh, uh, changes its policy with respect <coughs> to North Korean refugees. So uh, making both this kind of diplomatic uh, putting this kind of putting on this kind of diplomatic pressure. And at the same time, trying to uh, persuade China to uh, the Beijing government to view this uh, issue from a somewhat different, more, I guess, uh, realistic uh, perspective too, uh, hopefully uh, could lead to some uh, a more humane uh, policy uh, from Beijing. And uh, I think um, it's important also that we have a consistent message on this uh, topic, uh, that uh, we don't, especially now that uh, uh, the uh, the Chinese government may at any any uh, any moment res uh, the Chinese North Korean government at any moment uh, e uh, end the border restrictions that uh, this issue will not be something that we just forget uh, but uh, something that uh, the international community will continue to uh, observe and uh, uh, monitor. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Shin, Ms. Song. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, to echo uh, what Ethan said in terms of diplomat to pressure, I, I would just like to echo what he said, but also add another layer of what we can do from the bottom up as well, not just governments, but what China can do right now and what we have been able to see in recent years happening. As, um, as we had heard from the 
statements before, many of the women who, are, who go to China are trafficked to men from uh, northeastern provinces in China who have had difficulty in marrying anybody else in China, which is why they will traffic and bring women over from North Korea. As a result, there are many families where the mother or, or the wife is from North Korea, and the husbands, when they know that their wives are at danger of being repatriated, will pressure their local government, lo local municipalities, local governments to recognize this marital status and to recognize the children who were born to the North Korean mother and Chinese father. Now, this does not mean these women have are recognized as asylum seekers or recognized as refugees, but it's a start. They have limited, very limited, but they do have some type of uh, identification, some type of uh, rights to stay at least within China, and that's where we can at least protect those who are in China at this very moment. This doesn't, of course, address the issue of those who are detained at the border at this very moment, but what we can begin with is looking at ways in which we can uh, engage with and persuade the Chinese government to provide protection measures to the many women who are in China because they are married to their own Chinese citizens and are mothers to their own Chinese uh, youth as well. So, Ms. Song, I, I, I heard, had heard a lot about uh, women who tried to escape North Korea being married off to, to farmers. Um, I hadn't heard about trafficking that involved some other form of pulling women out of North Korea for the purpose of marrying them. To am, I, am I understanding from your description that that also takes place? So it's often that the, uh, the farmers, or not all men in these rural areas, will be looking for a spouse. Often they know that their chances increase if it is a it is somebody from North, North Korea because the prices are lower as well. And so to the broker, they will ask them to seek a wife, and then the broker will often bring somebody from we'll North Korea. Some. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Wild. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, Senator Merkley, for um, convening this important hearing. Um, the, the testimony has made it clear that this is a tragic and enormous problem, um, which doesn't in any way suggest that uh, the U.S. and international organizations shouldn't be tackling it, but it certainly is um, a very difficult one to tackle. And I appreciate the the very um, succinct and and specific recommendations that we've heard today. I let me just start. Um, with you, Mrs. Ms. Song, I, I'm curious um, about the fact that nearly three quarters of the escapees from North Korea are women. Why? And by the way, I had to step out briefly. I'm sorry if I missed the reason for that. But could you just enlighten me? Yes, thank you, uh, Senator Wild. There are uh, representative, just so you know. Sorry, that's sorry. okay. Representative Wild. Um, there are two factors that we can consider into why the majority of the escapees are women. Firstly, it's the internal factor in North Korea, where um, women in North Korea have relatively more freedom of movement compared to the men. Despite the fact that uh, the men are not uh, compensated for their work, they are still expected to report to their factories, to their workplace every day. On the other hand, women are given <coughs> their a work status of being a housewife, and they use take that to their advantage of being able to travel to different provinces, um, and that is how uh, North Korea, in fact, has been able to survive despite the Great Famine in the late 1990s and early 2000s. It was the women who went to the markets. It was the women who went to China, smuggled goods, and was able to keep the economy alive. At the same time, it's also the women who are vulnerable to being trafficked to China because of the pull factor from China in which, as I mentioned to uh, Senator Merkley before. Well, I, and I was going to get to that. I was just curious about why more, so many more women than men. Um, and, and do the, these women generally travel in groups or individually when they are attempting to escape? Mostly uh, individually, because if they are caught as a group, 
it is very clear that they are trying to escape the country. And if they are, if there is more evidence that they are trying to escape the country, then they are labeled at for to be a political criminal. But if they are traveling as an individual, they in the past, so before COVID, of course, they could bribe the state officials, convince them to say, oh, I was just going to China to do some trade, I was going to come back. Okay. Um, and in that case, they could be, um, it could be seen as an economic crime, which is seen to be less severe than a political crime. And so the, the subject that you brought up of women being brokered, I guess, to marry farmers and other men in, in China, um, is that sometimes presented as an alternative to incarceration for them if they are caught as escapees? Not so. There are a few cases in which the North Korean officials are selling these women to Chinese men. It's often that they are middlemen who are often Korean Chinese um, from the Korean Chinese ethnic group who are the who are brokering them. I really meant on the Chinese end right. of things. Is that something that's offered? Offered is a bad word as an alternative to being imprisoned. Or is that st strictly something that happens on the black market level? I think they're separate okay. issues. But there are cases in which if a North Korean woman is married to then a Chinese husband, he may use his network in China to be able to prevent them being incarcerated and sent back to North Korea. Okay, thank you very much. And so um, to the group at large, and particularly Mr. Shin, I, but maybe you could lead with this, but. So are there recommendations for the international community to formulate a gender-based approach to this huge problem? Uh, I, uh, thank you, Congresswoman. That, that's, a, I think, definitely a relevant uh, point. And uh, just wanted to add to what Hannah said earlier that uh, uh, it's the sad fact of life that for most North Koreans, the only way that uh, they can escape from their country is through this kind of trafficking, unless you're a very rich person in the in uh, North Korea, and uh, that also kind of accounts for why there are so many <coughs> uh, women refugees than uh, men refugees, uh, compared very different from other uh, refugee situations. And I'm sorry for interrupting, but if you happen to be a very wealthy person who wants to leave North Korea, mm -hmm. do you still have to escape, or are there semi-legal methods of doing so? It's, uh, you can win <coughs> permits from the North Korean government through official channels, uh, but it's more likely that they will be using this um, uh, under, uh, well, uh, black market uh, channels because the North Korean government keeps a very close tap on the on its citizens when they, if they want to leave the country, they don't usually allow it for the typical reasons that we would uh, consider legitimate. Thank you, okay, so sorry for interrupting. So is there something you would recommend um, that could be gender-based. Uh, and I'll ask the others if anybody has anything to offer on that after. Mr. Sure, sure. Just following up on the, the recommendation from CEDO, uh, that uh, the, the recognition from the Chinese government that, they, that these women are, vic in many cases, victims of trafficking, and that they should be accorded protection under the uh, Palermo Protocol, um, the treaty concerning human trafficking. And uh, it's uh, we uh, so there's some we NGOs are somewhat cautious about this uh, way we approach trafficking because uh, ironically the North Korean government and also the Chinese government have been very active in uh, rounding up the human traffickers and uh, their rationale is that uh, these uh, brokers are traffickers <coughs> and uh, which is partly true but uh, they're not really interested in protecting these trafficked women and uh, girls, but more uh, as using this as a legitimate tool to clamp down on this kind of uh, uh, the movement of people from North Korea to, to China. So basically we would recommend that uh, while China or North Korea even uh, try, try, uh, claims to uh, enforce the trafficking law, that it should take into consideration this kind of very gendered aspect uh, of the refugees flow. And Ambassador King or Ambassador Lee, do either of you want to respond in any way as to whether there should be a gender-based approach to this? Sure. Um, if I may. Sure. Please. Yeah. So certainly, I mean, because um, the the number speaks uh, for itself that um, it's already been, you know, it's it's, it's well known that the 
a very high percentage, as, as much as you know, over 80% of the refugees are, are, are women. So, but I wouldn't stop at just taking a gender-based approach to the North Korean refugees crisis issues uh, in China. It's also a religion-based uh, approach should be taken and also children-based um, approach should also be taken. So I think it has to be multifaceted. Um, children issue is, I mean, there's a very um, well-known um, activist in uh, NGO activist in South Korea by the name of Tim Peters, Tim Peters, who works on um, these children born out of mixed marriage in China. Um, and the number is quite staggering. I mean, I mean, he quotes as, as many as 40 to 50,000 uh, kids in China uh, who, who, you know, who, who just roam the streets and, 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 and try to make a living uh, in China. So um, certainly gender, but also religion and also uh, uh, children based approaches are, are necessary. And if I may um, take the opportunity to just go back to one aspect um, of question that was raised by uh, co-chair um, Merkley in terms of, um, um, in terms of, you know, taking action, doing something about it. When I became the, you know, human rights ambassador in 2013, uh, one of the first things that, that I did was to, um, to make, make a CD and, and write letters to almost 30 celebrities in, in Hollywood, trying to reach out to them um, to, to, you know, hoping that, you know, they, they would take on the North Korean human rights issue. Um, but unfortunately, I, I did not get uh, any response from any of them. And these were all very famous people that I wrote to, like Angelina Jolie's and George Clooney's, uh, Oprah, uh, Oprah Winfrey's. Um, I know that PACC is a very influential organization of the Congress. I think it really would be a huge um, help to get on board uh, some of the celebrities or athletes to take on the North Korean human rights issue, the, the refugee issue in China. Um, We've had limitations. I know. I know our ambassador Bob King also tried to do this. But if the Congress can get on board to to really find some um, celebrities to take on this issue, I think it will be a huge event, a well, huge plus for the for the campaign. Thank you. That actually leads into another question that I have. But I would like to ask if if you don't mind, can you forward? Um, this commission a copy of the letter that you sent to these celebrities um, so that we can review it and perhaps uh, formulate our own letter and attach yours um, because I think that's very, very important. Um, it does lead into the question that I had about um, the overall international community's approach to this situation um, and whether it should be a high profile approach or a behind the scenes approach. And, you know, the first thing I don't, I guess I don't really understand is whether high level pressure, um, celebrity pressure and that kind of thing has any kind of impact on, um, the, on the president and other leaders in North Korea. Can you just tell me that first? Or are they oblivious to high level celebrity um, pressure? North Korean leaders are ob oblivious to anything. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador King. High-level celebrities, uh, Clooney. Uh, Doesn't matter. Oprah. Won't make, make it. Any difference. Won't make a difference. And that's largely because they're so isolated, insulated sure. from any pressure right. uh, from their own people uh, or anyone else. They do ha feel some pressure from the Chinese, to some extent from the Russians. They feel some pressure from the United Nations. But uh, this is a regime that is so totalitarian that they are really. Although, as we have seen, um, they are responsive to um, flattery by um, certain 
<laughs> a certain United States president um, and seem to revel in that, correct? Oh, I, uh, yeah, they revel in it, but it doesn't last very okay. long. Okay. Um, so w I wanted to, I was intrigued by Ambassador Lee's um, recommendation about launching an international campaign similar to the one that was done with South Africa. Um, and I'd be curious, perhaps Ambassador Lee, you could answer this first, but I'd be here, curious to hear from any of you, what would a first step be to do something like what was done with South, South Africa? And well, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I, think, I think we have to um, um, first understand the UN General Assembly procedures um, um, and see, you know, because that, when that happened in 1974, um, of course, the president of the UN General Assembly uh, took the initiative. Um, and then uh, later on, uh, there was a vote at the General Assembly. The thing is, this is not an expulsion. Um, there is a spe specific article uh, that deals with expulsions, but you know that's more of a UN charter. Um, and in, in such a case, the Security Council has a say. Uh, and there, which means that it's just not going to work because of the, you know, because of China and, and, and Russia. But in the case of 1974, South Africa, you know, how, how things happen, um, it, it, it happened within the General Assembly. That's, that's what gives me hope that, you know, it might be possible uh, without the interference of the Security Council. So I think we have to approach the, you know, to, to see who the members of the Credentials Committee are. Uh, what, you know, uh, have some diplomatic um, uh, approaches to the president of the uh, General Assembly and proceed as such. Now, it may not work, but, just, you know, just the fact that this, these sort of efforts are being made uh, is, a, is a huge pressure uh, on the DPRK uh, to, to, you know, get, it, get, get its act straight. Now, um, you were earlier mentioning about, you know, does it really matter um, I think it does, uh, because when the COI report came out, and particularly, you know, uh, recommending that the, 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 the North, Korean, North Korean perpetrators, uh, the human rights issue be referred by the Security Council to the ICC, International Criminal Court, North Korea responded very, very sensitively. So they don't like the international community finding out about you know uh, about all the all the human rights violations that's going on uh, in North Korea so I would assume if some of the very high profile celebrities uh, start talking about human rights abuses and, and and situations in North Korea I think it would matter and who should be the person or group of persons who would approach the UN General Assembly the, to the uh, credentials committee, who would you recommend that be? I think it has to be done at the governmental level. So there has to be some coordination between the you know U.S. and South Korean government. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm speaking not as a government official. Sure. It's just my you know personal idea. So you know, please don't. No, I understand. Um, I, I just find it to be an to intriguing say, you know, idea. And yeah. um, Ambassador King. Do you, with your many years of experience um, with North Korea, think that that is a reasonable approach? Is that a, a good approach? Because The reason I'm asking is because what I'm hearing is that they, they, while they may be sensitive to criticism, it, since they don't really have any feedback or repercussions from their own citizens, it's very hard to penetrate a government like that and, and to effectuate any kind of change. Do you have any thoughts on what a first step would be to? You know, the North Koreans are sensitive to international pressure. Uh, when North Korea looks bad internationally, they are concerned about that uh, fact. That happened when the, com uh, the uh, Commission of Inquiry report was published by the, uh, hum in the Human Rights Council in uh, 2014. Uh, the North Koreans were suddenly uh, uh, the foreign minister, for example, who had not attended the New York 
September meetings where all of the high-level officials attend. First time in 14 years, the South Korean foreign minister showed up. Uh, there you was, said South Korean. Do you mean I'm, North Korean? Excuse me. The North, we'll get the Koreas straightened out. Yeah, the North Korean foreign minister showed mm -hmm. up. So there is an effect. One of the things that has been very positive in terms of putting pressure on North Korea is debating North Korea's human rights in the, in the uh, Security Council. Uh, when the report came out from the Commission of Inquiry, the issue was taken up in the Security Council. At the time, uh, the United States worked cooperatively with other countries. Uh, the Security Council does not take action unless all five permanent members agree, but you can have a discussion as long as you have a majority of nine members of the Security Council calling for a discussion. And so we had a, a, a program going of annual discussions of North Korea's human rights problems at the Security Council. This raised it to the level of, you know, it's not just something we're dealing with in this uh, organization that deals with human rights, it's something the Security Council is concerned about and talks about. And uh, which countries does North Korea most worry about um, being influenced by this negative publicity about their human rights abuses? I mean, yeah, China, obviously, but who else? China and Russia, but they're not going to object. Right. They're not going to be a problem. But basically, the good countries of the world, okay. they want respect from... They, so it's a respect? Is it a matter of respect, mostly? Uh, part of it is respect. The North Koreans are sensitive about their stature. Uh, North Korea has some real questions about its legitimacy. Uh, there is a Korea, uh, and there's a sense that there's one Korea. And when you look at North Korea and it's being uh, discussed in the Security Council, and they're having votes against uh, North Korea because of its human rights, it questions the legitimacy of the North Korean government. And so there's value in continuing to do this. This is one reason why the Security Council debate was important and why it was very unfortunate that the United States has stepped in two or three times to block that from happening. We're back on track now. It's taking place. We need to continue this effort of questioning the credentials and, and of, of the North Koreans, and that is the way to put pressure on them. I've gone way over my allotted time, but let me just ask Mr. Shin and Ms. Song, do either of you want to add anything else to any of the prior discussion in response to my questions? Thank you, Congressman. I think I definitely agree with everything that has been discussed thus far, and uh, also want to add that the uh, the this also given the difficulty of uh, uh, the Security Council reaching any uh, agreement about North Korea these days. Uh, Perhaps it is possible. It is very important. The General Assembly, perhaps, is also an important forum, uh, as was the case with Ukraine and other uh, uh, country situations. And I just also want to add that uh, uh, since we are at the CECC meeting here, China's responsibility uh, this, that's one aspect that has not been fully uh, or uh, adequately raised. Uh, in the uh, over the past years, it has been raised in the COI <coughs> report, for example, but uh, it hasn't. Even the NGOs, uh, quite frankly, have not really focused on the role that China has been playing. And uh, I think uh, it's important to hold China accountable for what's happening in North Korea because that, at the end of the day, they are the enabler. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, also, it's important for the reason that uh, Xi Jinping probably cares more about the this kind of international repercussions than. And Kim Jong-un right. might, well, okay. so. so it's an indirect effect. And Ms. Mm -hmm. Song, did you want to say anything? Yes, the only um, other thing I would add to uh, what has been already mentioned in terms of the international launching an international campaign is we shouldn't just be thinking about what the North Korean leadership thinks of having an international campaign, but what the North Korean people would react to. One of the reasons why the North Korean human rights issue hasn't had as much attention, despite the fact that it's been going on for 25, 30 years in which NGOs have been continuously coming to the Hill, going to the UN, raising this issue, but hasn't had as much attention is, unfortunately, many North Korean escapees who even live in South Korea and the US are still afraid to speak out. They're afraid of the reper repercussions that their family would face, but also afraid that they will be 
you know, shunned, looked away, and not given the recognition that they need. Um, so having more North Korean voices at the table, I think, is crucial. Um, have, having the recognition that many other vulnerable and minority groups are being had by the international community is such a source of strength that I think would allow us to have more information and know more about this very isolated country. Thank you very much. That's a really important point. They certainly deserve to know of our support and our condemnation of the actions of China, in, uh, which is most relevant, of course, to this commission. I thank you all um, for a really excellent presentation. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wild. Uh, without objection, we will have three written submissions from Greg Scarliuto, uh, Suzanne Schulte, and Joanna uh, Hosaniak. Uh, without objection, they will be made a part of the record. And before I go to just a couple of final questions, um, uh, I want to thank especially, I mean, we have a, an amazing group of people who staff the China Commission, uh, uh, just an amazing group that, that our scholars are, are, uh, do the due diligence, the, the, the hard work of um, knowing what really is going on and, and, and denying surface appeal argumentation. They go far beyond that uh, and really pierce the issue. So I, I want to thank them for their help in, in not just this hearing, but all the work we do. I especially want to thank Juan, uh, for, who's our uh, special advisor, a fellow, uh, who did Yeoman's work on this hearing, but also provides the commission with just tremendous insights especially as it relates to Korea, North Korea, and South, and China. Uh, I want to thank uh, Pierre Tazi, who's our general counsel, uh, who um, uh, just has done a tremendous amount of work, and he speaks fluent Chinese. So, uh, you know, when we get into discussions, um, uh, particularly with interlocutors who are, would rather speak China, Chinese, there's uh, Piero, uh, and I sit there, and I have to get translation from both. Uh, both sides. I want to thank uh, Matt Squeary, who's uh, uh, Senator Merkley's uh, top uh, staffer on the commission for his tremendous work, and Scott Flipsey, uh, who has been with the commission and does tremendous work. As I've pointed out before, some of the bills that have become law, including the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, were, were his idea. So I want to thank you all, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but we do have a great uh, commission uh, group of staffers, and I'm just so grateful for the work that they do. Just a, a brief question on the issue of, um, of the Security Council. We know that South Korea just won a seat on the, on the uh, non-permanent member, uh, 180 votes in their favor out of 192 potential. So it was an overwhelming support, uh, show of support for South Korea. And uh, Hwang Jong-kuk, uh, the ambassador to the United Nations, made some a very good statement. He did not mention, and I'm sure he will, uh, you know, the North Korea issue as it relates to the uh, forced repatriation of people from China. Uh, but this would seem to me to be a prime opportunity working with the United States, I would hope, and other uh, democracies uh, to ensure that there is robust discussion about these uh, individuals, all human rights, obviously, in North Korea, uh, but also to really focus on this imminent forced repatriation. You know, delay is denial for them. If we delay and say someday something good might happen there, well, we have 2,000 plus more victims some of whom may be executed, tortured, and all the other terrible things. Uh, so I, I think we need to be uh, you know, doing whatever we can to assist the South Koreans as they assume that very important position. I also, um, you know, if, if, if perhaps you want to speak to that, our, our distinguished panel, but um, uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, uh, Crittenbrink, recently went to China. We don't know exactly all what was talked about. There were some critics, including myself, who wished that he would, given the proximity to his visit to the Tiananmen Square Massacre Remembrance. Uh, nothing was mentioned about that. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, when you look to see what they've done in, in Hong Kong, they being Xi Jinping, they actually shut down not only the country, but even any remembrance, uh, which they claim didn't, does, didn't happen. You know, you go on their social media, and I've done it in, in internet cafes in Beijing, and type in Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square Massacre, and you got a, a bunch of pretty pictures, no tanks, no bayonets, uh, and they say nobody died. When Zhou Tian came here uh, for a visit, as uh, he was the operational commander uh, for uh, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, uh, he was now defense minister, and he was received at the White House by Bill Clinton with a 19-gun salute. He should have been sent to The Hague for crimes against humanity. He had the audacity to say nobody died at Tiananmen Square. Nobody. 
he was asked a question at the Army War College, uh, and um, uh, and he said that I put together a hearing in two days. We had people who were there who told the story about all the death and mayhem uh, and violence committed by the Ch People's Liberation Army. So um, the hope is that that would have been raised. But we need to direct, I think, our comments and our focus on the administration here as well, including Secretary Blinken, uh, as well as uh, Crittenbrink, you know, Secretary uh, Crittenbrink, uh, to really raise this issue now, you know, with this matter of urgency. Because once these people are returned, uh, <laughs> Who knows, God knows what's going to happen to them in terms of the violence they will suffer. So there needs to be a sense of urgency, which perhaps you might want to amplify a bit on uh, right now. And, and um, finally, um, uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that and just ask if you could answer those uh, or, or maybe speak to those two issues. Security Council and uh, trying to get our administration to do even more right now. And the pivot. Uh, one of the things that I'm encouraged about is that uh, my successor uh, has been nominated by the president, has actually had a uh, hearing in the Senate. I'm sorry Senator Merkley isn't here. I'd like to see the Senate actually vote on that nomination so that uh, she can take, take her place. It is helpful to have a special envoy for North Korea human rights issues. And I think it's encouraging that we've got that, and I think that's an important step forward. Uh, I think it's very useful to have discussions like we've had today. Thank you for having this session and being able to air these issues, because I think that makes a big difference in terms of raising the level of consciousness here in the United States, but also in North Korea, thanks to Voice of America and Radio Free Asia, who are getting the word out on this. Thank you for doing that. Ambassador Lee? Yes. Um, President Yoon of South Korea, President Yoon song yeol is very much committed to improving the human rights situation in North Korea and also raising the issue uh, on a global scale. Um, Ambassador Hwang jung whom you've mentioned, who is South Korea's um, ambassador to the United Nations, is a very good friend of mine. And um, he is also very um, stout on the human rights issue. So it's a fantastic news that South Korea has just joined the Security Council uh, as its non-permanent member. And I'm sure that, you know, um, that's one out of, you know, 10 non-permanent uh, membership. Um, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll make every effort to get the North Korean human rights issue back on the agenda uh, of the uh, Security Council. We have to remember that, you know, you have like over 10 um, Security Council resolutions and sanctions on North Korea, but none of them, none of them are on North Korean human rights. They're all on North Korean missiles and, and you know, nuclear tests. So I think it's, you know, it's important that the Security Council, you know, as we now take a, a non-permanent membership, um, try to bring the human rights issue, um, you know, to the fore so that, so that, you know, resolutions can be adopted on this issue as well. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, th uh, it's really encouraging that uh, South Korea has recently been elected to the, uh, the Security Council next year. And uh, we certainly hope that the resumption of the public briefing and uh, discussion of North Korean human rights situation resumes now. It's probably not going to be easy given the requirement for nine uh, procedure, nine votes, supports uh, supporting countries for this kind of procedural votes. But uh, we, we hope that this kind of uh, diplomatic efforts will be redoubled. And uh, I think it's also it's so interesting that you mentioned the Tiananmen Square and uh, incident and other uh, Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong issues. And uh, I think this kind of, uh, we noticed this kind of connection between like the North Koreans and other refugees in China and uh, also the other uh, issues in China during the CEDAW discussion. So uh, we hope that that kind of discor discourse might also be take place in, uh, in, China, in the, at the UN level as well. Um, and. Uh, I, again, like uh, hope, like, as uh, Ambassador King said, that uh, Julie Turner's uh, 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 appointment as the special envoy will take uh, soon rather than later. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I, as you mentioned, it's very important uh, that the issue of North Korean human rights is raised at the uh, human, the Security Council, excuse me, and we hope that uh, South Korea's seat at the table will make that more likely. But as you mentioned, I think it would be even more important to tie it to the Chinese issue. In the past, there have been discussions and advocacy efforts to just raise the issue of North Korean human rights at the Security Council, um, but having this transnational element, I think, would uh, allow more international attention to be brought to the issue. In terms of what the U.S. government could do more of, um, in addition, so last uh, Human Rights Day, Secretary of State Antony Blinken um, designated the North Korean border guards to be put on the U.S. Uh, sanctions list, uh, the Magnitsky-style sanctions. Um, yet the Public Security Border Defense Corps on the Chinese side, who are also very responsible, as we have seen and discussed today, they are not being held accountable for their involvement in the repatriation of North Koreans. So um, we hope that we'd be able to see more of these uh, designation and appointments of the, all who are involved in the human rights violations that are perpetrated against North Koreans. If I could just uh, and give you the last word on this, uh, Hannah Sung, you had mentioned um, in your discussion about satellite imagery that at least one Chinese detention center had been enlarged. Uh, I wonder what you think is necessitating that, and if you could speak to the issue of the wall uh, that's being apparently uh, uh, built um, the Guardian and Reuters have both reported on it. Um, what does that signal in terms of relations between China and North Korea? As I mentioned in my statement, unfortunately, it's difficult to know exactly what the situation is without speaking to those who have either been detained there or have passed through in the past when NKDB has gathered data on these six detention facilities. We either did field investigations in China itself or were able to speak to former officials who worked in the detention facilities or North Korean escapees who had been detained there once and were able to come safely to South Korea. What we, can, what we can only do at the moment is pose some questions. Um, from our understanding, from our many testimonies that we've gathered from North Korean escapees, they are not uh, they are not subjected to forced labor on the Chinese side. They're subjected to forced labor on the North Korean side because they're only detained in the past for a few weeks, longest a few months before they are forcibly repatriated. Now, what we're facing is a different issue because they've been detained there for as long as three years for some of them. We don't have concrete evidence for this, but this is just a question that needs to be monitored, uh, something that we can monitor. Is, is China also now subjecting North Korean detainees to forced labor during their long detention within these detention facilities? I think that is an area in which more investigations need to be done, either by satellite imagery, or hopefully we will be able to have more access on the ground. Um, that is, but that is something that NKDB is looking at. And in terms of the um, fencing on the uh, Chinese side, that again shows uh, Chinese res China's responsibility in um, in also preventing North Koreans and restricting their freedom of movement and how they should also be um, subject to accountability measures and not just the DPRK government. Thank you. Would any of you like to make any final word or do you think we... Because, again, your testimonies were outstanding. If not, uh, I thank you again for your conveying to this commission the wisdom and knowledge that... You have certainly well honed, and uh, this hearing is now adjourned.